Today, we are diving into an interesting and I think very important topic, the recent expedition led by astrophysicist Avi Loeb, which happens to be our guest tonight. The expedition retrieved metallic spheres from the Pacific Ocean near Papua New Guinea, exhibiting a unique composition labeled, oh my God, Bilau? Did I say that right? <laughs> yes, you did. Yeah, let's talk about that later. These findings hint an interstellar origin, and they are challenging our understanding of celestial objects. And tonight we want to explore the details of this discovery and its potential implications with Avi Loeb himself. So welcome, Avi. Thank you for taking the time today. Thanks for having me. So before we go deep into all this, a few words to all your listeners out there. If you have no idea what we are talking about right now, please follow the link in the description that leads you to a previous episode with Avi that explains more about the beginning of Avi's expedition and chase for these awesome little spherules. So <laughs> uh, with that out, out of the way... Um, let me start with um, five of these ferules exhibited a unique composition labeled, like I said, Bilau, containing high abundances of beryllium, lanthanum, and uh, uranium. This composition suggests an interstellar origin um, with iron isotope ratios different from those found in our solar system. Um, now, I have seen and read a lot of content on the internet now that says that uh, Avilope has found alien material, artificial manufactured alien material, and so on and so on. So please, Avi, fill us in where some people went wrong with that and let us know what this composition of elements really means. Yeah, so let me start from the beginning uh, about a decade ago on January 8th, 2014. The US government uh, satellites spotted uh, a fireball uh, as a result of an object that collided with Earth and burnt up in the lower atmosphere. Uh, that object uh, was roughly half a meter in size, released a few percent of the Hiroshima atomic energy output. Um, and the, the location of the fireball was uh, about uh, 90 kilometers away from uh, Manus Island in Papua New Guinea over the Pacific Ocean. And um, uh, based on the velocity measurement of the object, uh, one could infer that it's not bound to the sun. It's not gravitationally bound. It's moving too fast, and it came from outside the solar system. It also had the uh, material strength that was tougher than uh, even iron meteorites uh, because it exploded, it disintegrated only when the stress on it was far greater than that uh, on any other rock that we have seen before from the solar system. And outside the solar system, it was moving faster than 95% of the stars. So that raised an interesting question. What is it? Clearly, it seems to be made of materials different than in the solar system. Uh, and uh, also, you know, the fact that it was moving so fast is difficult to explain. Uh, it was moving at 60 kilometers per second relative to the local standard of rest of um, the Milky Way galaxy, that's the local frame of reference. And stars move at uh, uh, typically 30 kilometers per second. So the question is, how can you eject uh, an object from a planetary system like ours? Uh, if it comes from the inner part, uh, it has to be inside the Earth's orbit because the Earth moves around the sun only at 30 kilometers per second. So it's difficult to imagine um, a rock that is orbiting so close to the star and somehow ejects rocks. Um, and so the question is, what was the origin of this object? And of course, that raises the possibility that it may have been a Voyager like a meteor, an object that was produced uh, artificially and has an unusual material strength, unusual speed. And to find out, we went to that uh, location, which was um, uh, localized by the Department of Defense um, uh, to within about 10 kilometers. Um, so we also managed to uh, localize it even better using data from a seismometer in Papua New Guinea. Uh, and so I led an expedition. We collected the 850 molten droplets from that uh, region of uh, 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers around the, the meteor explosion site. 
uh, and uh, we brought them back to two laboratories, one uh, at Harvard University, led by my colleague, uh, Professor Stein Jacobson, who is a world-renowned uh, geochemist and has uh, the best uh, mass spectrometer in the world, uh, the best um, electron uh, microprobe, uh, electron microscope that analyzes uh, the, sp the spherules can give us images. And also we shared it with the laboratory of uh, Dr. Roald Tagel at the Brucker Corporation in Berlin, uh, Germany. And uh, based on eight months of analysis, so we came back, the expedition was uh, in June, 2023. Um, and then uh, uh, since we came back at the end of June, it took eight months uh, to do the analysis of all the spherules. And uh, the bottom line is that we find that about 10% of them, about 80 or so spherules, have a composition that was never reported before uh, for solar system uh, materials. Uh, and uh, that includes uh, enhancements by up to a factor of a thousand relative to the abundance of elements that you find in the early material that made the solar system. Uh, and th those elements that are enhanced, as you mentioned, include the beryllium, lanthanum, uranium, and many other uh, rare elements. We analyzed 60 of them. And uh, we call it Belau because it's enhanced in beryllium, lanthanum, and uranium. And um, one, uh, the question is then, what could be the origin of such an unusual composition. I mean, it's not found in the on Earth, in the Earth's crust. It's not found on the moon, uh, Mars, or asteroids. And we suggest that a, a possible natural origin would be uh, a planet that has a magma ocean, uh, basically molten rock on its surface. And then um, if it's uh, for a long enough time, then some elements get uh, attracted to the core of the planet where there is iron because they have affinity to iron. And those uh, elements are the ones that we find them uh, missing uh, that have lower abundance in the Belau spherules. And the ones that are left behind stay in the crust of the planet. And those are the ones that we find enhanced. The question is, how do you get them ejected in a rock uh, at a speed of 60 kilometers per second into interstellar space? And on that, I wrote uh, a paper that provides a pos possible explanation. Um, uh, the most abundant population of stars have a tenth of the mass of the sun. They are much uh, uh, less massive than the sun, 10 times less massive. And they are also 10 times smaller. And so you pack a tenth of the mass of the sun in a region that is 10 times smaller, you end up with a density that is 100 times bigger than the density of the sun. And it's bigger than the density of rock. So when you take a planet like the Earth and bring it close to such a dwarf star, which is the most common type of star uh, in the Milky Way galaxy, it would rip the planet apart um, by the tidal force. Uh, we know about the tides that raise uh, the level of the ocean, uh, excited by the moon. But if you take a planet like the Earth and put it next to a dwarf star, it would actually uh, spaghettify the planet, make a stream of rocks out of it, and it turns out that half of the mass of the planet would be ejected to interstellar space. And guess what? At the speed of about 60 kilometers per second, if you do the calculation. So uh, it's, it could well be that this is the process that makes interstellar rocks. But we don't know if the object was a rock or a technological gadget. And uh, to find out, we are planning the next expedition to look for bigger pieces. And I should say we published uh, uh, two papers, uh, two research notes on the findings. And we have a very extended paper that we just completed a week ago, submitted uh, for publication. And so uh, we provide all the results, which are really unprecedented. I've never seen a paper of an ocean expedition that reports about so many spherules. Uh, usually the reports are about 10 times less. and. Uh, also, the results that uh, we found are quite unusual. Uh, and so it may be the first time that humans put their hands on materials from a big object that came from outside the solar system, which would be historic, you know, irrespective of whether it's natural or artificial, because, you know, it's just the first time. And 
the, the fundamental question is, among all the rocks that we might find, is there any Voyager-like uh, meteor that we might find? And that's why we're also planning to go to the location of the second interstellar meteor that, that we know of uh, that US government satellites identified. So it's uh, very exciting, I should say. It is exciting indeed. Yeah, very exciting. How did you feel when you had these little spherules in your hand? Yeah, so uh, for the first six days, we were at sea for two weeks. And uh, in the first day, we couldn't keep the, the sled with the magnets that collected the particles. Uh, it was difficult to keep it on the ocean floor because the cable connecting it to the ship was lifting it. Uh, it was kiting. Uh, and eventually we got it on the floor after a day. And then uh, for s five more days, we all we saw is uh, volcanic ash that we collected. Uh, it was not clear to us that we are finding anything other than uh, volcanic activity, geological activity on Earth. Um, and uh, then on the, uh, on the evening of the sixth day, uh, we decided uh, to filter out the volcanic ash and see if there are any bigger particles left that we can look at uh, with a microscope. And I remember um, the geologist on the team running down the stairs to call me because I, I was the chief uh, scientist on the ship. And uh, he was telling me, we found a spheroid. And I ran up the stairs and uh, there it was uh, through the microscope image. Uh, it was very distinct from the background of, of uh, sand that we found. And I basically hugged the person who found it uh, because I said, look, this is what we were looking for. And it's amazing. We now found it. And I knew that just like in the kitchen, when you find a, an ant, you know that there are many more ants out there. Uh, and sure enough, we found 50 of them um, on the ship and then... Uh, uh, an intern, a summer intern, after I brought the materials back to Harvard, um, Sophie Bergstrom that uh, came to uh, shadow me, uh, she wanted to become a, a science journalist, uh, asked me if she can help with the science. I said, sure, and gave her a pair of tweezers and a microscope. And uh, within a week, she found 600 of them in the materials and increased the sample by a factor of 10. And I then uh, gave her the title the spheral hunter and uh, her success now convinced her that she would like to pursue a career in science not science journalism uh, and so i feel very happy about that awesome as a scientist involved in this historic interstellar expedition how do you view the role of exploration in expanding not only our scientific knowledge but also our philosophical perspectives on the vastness and diversity of the cosmos? Yeah, so there are two aspects to it. One is that, um, you know, we should be modest. Uh, our imagination is much more limited than that of nature, and we should learn from nature. And the best way to learn from nature is to collect data and evidence and see what it tells us, not to assume that we know the answer in advance. And, um, you know, that is a, a good lesson for all of science. And unfortunately, many scientists have strong opinions and they do not seek evidence. And some of them work for their entire careers on uh, concepts that represent past knowledge, uh, you know, without doubting it, uh, because part of the motivation for them is to demonstrate that they are smart, not to really figure out nature. And to demonstrate that you are smart, you just need to do intellectual gymnastics and it doesn't really matter. You know, you don't want to take any risks um, by exploring things that are not known to us. Um, but the way I see it is more as a learning experience. Uh, science is like a detective story. You're trying to learn something that you didn't know before. And obviously you take risks and in the process of doing that, you might be wrong uh, on occasion. You might think the clues uh, lead you one way and then you uh, when you collect more data it turns out to be the other way so but as long as you are not doing it for your ego as long as you're not trying to show that you're to show off but you're trying to learn what nature is all is good you know it's a thrilling experience uh, you learn something new but if you really want 
to show off, you prefer not to take risks. And when something violates your, your uh, prejudice, you would argue against it. You would say, you know, the data is wrong. Uh, we don't really know. There are all kinds of doubts. You will basically raise dust in the air such that you could claim that you don't see anything. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened in my case when some people said, we don't believe the US government report. Even though the US Space Command had professionals look back at the data and confirm it in an official letter to NASA. And then uh, my, some of my colleagues wrote a scientific paper saying, even then they do not believe the US government uh, because it's just an official letter. They don't take into account the fact that there were professionals looking at the data within government to make sure that they, um, you know, that they are reliable. And 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 this uh, branch of government, the U.S. Space Command, is getting forty billion dollars a year, uh, more than NASA, to alert the U.S. president for any incoming ballistic missiles, and uh, they just cannot afford to be wrong. Nevertheless. Astronomers on the day that I came back from the expedition published a paper in the Astrophysical Journal claiming uh, that they don't believe the, the numbers in the data because they cannot fit those numbers with a model that they have for solar system stones. And I, I, I call that the stone age of science when everything in the sky must be stones. I mean, it's a sense of arrogance to claim that you don't believe data just because your model doesn't fit it. I also knew that the, the material strength of this meteor was very high, but I didn't claim the data is wrong. I just said, let's find what it is. And, and indeed, if it comes from a molten uh, magma ocean, you know, it's very likely that the material strength would be much higher because, um, you know, you, you concentrate the very heavy elements uh, and you first melt them uh, together into a a compound that could have a very high material strength, much more than you find in stone. So you should allow yourself to find something new. You can't claim data is wrong just because it doesn't fit your model for stones. And then the second part that I learned in this uh, uh, experience is that um, very often in life, you have to take um, risks uh, and you have to be an optimist because life is self-fulfilling prophecy sometimes. And if you don't search, you will not find anything. And um, and so in this particular expedition, all the stars were aligned. Everything went well, but it was a very risky uh, experimental project. Uh, first, I could have not ra raised the funds. It was one and a half million dollars. And, um, you know, a very wealthy individual contributed that. And... Um, then uh, it could have been that the, I wouldn't uh, bring on board the, the best uh, engineers that would design instruments that work. And they did, they delivered and the instruments worked. And, and then uh, we might have not found uh, anything from the meteor because it wasn't big enough to release enough particles for us to find something, uh, but we did. And then uh, uh, the experimentalists that look into the composition, they could have been busy and they could have said, we don't have time to help you, but it all worked out. And, um, you know, it's really important to not be swayed because a lot of people were telling me I will not find anything. When I went there, they said there is nothing for you to find uh, and it's impossible across such a big region to find anything. When I came back, they said that they don't believe the US government even though I had the materials already. And now when we analyze it, as, uh, there were two uh, uh, reports by scientists who said that um, they believe we found uh, coal ash, very common uh, substance that uh, you get from fires, for example, coal ash. And, and we looked at 55 elements and demonstrated beyond any reasonable doubt that it's not coal ash. So why would these scientists that have no access to the materials bring up all, these neg all this negativity? I think some of them are driven by the desire to step on every flower that rises above the grass level. They, they just get annoyed that someone else is doing interesting work. Um, and, you know, it goes against curiosity. If you are really curious about this object, let let other, you know, nobody is asking you to do any work. You're just sitting on your chair. So why spew out negativity? You can just 
wait and see what those people come up with, and then you can ask questions about it. Uh, that would be the constructive approach. But instead, there were these people who steadily made negative remarks and attacked personally. Those people who are actually doing the work, you know, and it was a huge amount of work. It took us a year to plan this, two weeks to be in the ocean. And I didn't sleep much because we had to wake up in the middle of the night to collect the materials. Then we bring it back. We work on it for eight months. But still, some people find it really uh, uh, necessary for them to, to somehow derail that investigation. And it's really unfortunate. And they, they were really, uh, also people like bloggers who would uh, make negative comments and they call themselves astrophysicists. If you look at the record, they don't have even a single publication over the past decade. So they're not really pra practicing scientists uh, and they resemble commentators looking at a soccer match and telling the players how to pass the ball. How dare they? You know, they are not really doing any science. And they uh, pretend to be the representatives that protect science. I, I would call them anti-science advocates because they are going against the scientific method, which is all about collecting evidence and data, analyzing it, and publishing it in peer-reviewed journals. So you, you find all of this, and you know, then you ask yourself, you know, is it really true that those people who claim to represent science to protect science are they really anti-science which is really strange you know like they're doing exactly the opposite of what they're pretending to be <laughs> and um, so i i had these these experiences and i prefer to take the approach of the eagle you know the eagle sometimes has a crow on its back that pecks at its neck and so the eagle instead of fighting the crow off uh, goes to greater heights where the oxygen level is low, and then the crow drops off the back of the eagle because it cannot stay there. And so for me, the best approach is to do the science to the best of my ability so that those critics who peck on my neck will drop off. They would have nothing to say. <laughs> yeah. I have so many more questions, but I want to clear the stage for Brandon here. I think yeah, it's just outstanding. Uh, professor, I, I, I do uh, have just something to say here and then before my question, then my, my question. Now, I, I'd like to expand your curiosity as we were talking about here and for all of us. Now, I've heard several talks that you've had. You're all over the place. You're fantastic. I actually had my first year doing a podcast. We had like 50 episodes. It's nowhere anymore. It's absolutely deleted. We did a whole episode on you and Moa Moa. And it was so, this is a really cool thing for me to sit here and to be able to have this conversation. So to that point, I heard you in a recent talk, uh, and to this, I'd like to explore the things not known to us that you just talked about earlier. So you, you say that you often tell young scientists, never pretend to be the adult in the room. And I love this. I, I thought that this was so fantastic because obviously it's a metaphor uh, for keeping your childlike wonder. Now to that, I, I firmly believe that you have two people to impress in this, in this world, your five-year-old version of you and your 85-year-old version of you, right? And sure. to that five-year-old smile that you just gave us there, I would like to give permission to just absolutely have some fun with this here, okay? And not to say I'm a professor at Harvard and we've got to stick to rigid. Let's explore the curiosity. Let's sort of some new heights. Let the crows fall off, okay? Loved your metaphor, by the way. Okay, when we talk about meteors and comets coming in from other outer space, right, and they may be bringing we don't know what with them. Now, one of the universal conduits for us that we have found important for life is water, right? Now, meteors and comets also, uh, comets especially, contain water. Now, who's to say that that water isn't coming from an outside source that has some sort of alien DNA, some sort of alteration to our human DNA, that then just infects, for a better sense of the word, these extremophiles, perhaps even parasites, that then could literally alter the consciousness of humanity, perhaps even tapping you on the shoulder from within to say, hey, Loeb, check out the, this Moa Moa thing. It might be a thread you want to pull on here, and maybe this is an inner working with extraterrestrial and us on a cellular level, probably brought from the cosmos on these beautiful rocks that glide through our skies, crash into our oceans, and maybe bring us a gift in these forms. And perhaps that's why comets were heralded throughout ancient times, because they signaled great change in humanity on many levels, right? So what are your thoughts on that, that actually... The aliens, if you will, are here with us in the form of DNA that we constantly get upgraded in in comet strikes on Earth carrying ancient water. 
Yeah, it's quite uh, possible. This process is called panspermia, where life uh, and influence uh, can be brought uh, or communicated between uh, planets and different environments. And we know, for example, that Earth and the Mars uh, exchange rocks throughout their history. And uh, in 1980, there was a rock that was analyzed and it, it became clear that it wasn't heated uh, by more than 40 degrees uh, Celsius uh, from the time it was launched from Mars and arrived at Earth. And that allows uh, tiny astronauts uh, like microbes to survive uh, on such a rock. And um, so this process of transfer of life um, and influence on life uh, at a distant location um, is definitely possible and, and relevant and also exchange between stars. Yeah, so interstellar objects could definitely affect what happens on Earth. And you know, it's possible that we are all Martians, that life started on Mars and arrived here. One uh, curious thing I would like uh, to do if I have the funding or the chance to do it is uh, to go into the caves, those lava tubes that are on Mars, because Mars lost its um, atmosphere about uh, two billion years ago when it was at the middle of its uh, lifespan. And if intelligent life developed on Mars twice as fast as it did on Earth, then it could have had some intelligence before uh, it lost its atmosphere and before it lost its liquid water on the surface. And so what I would like to do is go into those caves and check if there are any prehistoric uh, paintings on the cave walls of Mars. Um, that would be very interesting. Of course, NASA would like to know if there are any, if there were any microbes on early Mars. Uh, I would like to extend that to intelligent life as well. But to answer your question, definitely, you know, we are connected to the cosmos. We receive a lot of materials from it. And there is a possibility, especially if something technological arrives and it has a purpose, it could definitely change things for us. Uh, and, you know, humans came to exist only a few million years ago. That's uh, at the end of uh, the history of Earth. And the question is, why did it happen? Uh, there is also a period about uh, uh, 200 million years ago, where there was a, a global warming of the earth. We think that we are now triggering global warming, but the climate featured all the symptoms of global warming uh, about 200 million years ago. And uh, that was at the end of a, a, a period of uh, when uh, life uh, blossomed of, on, on earth. And an interesting question is whether we are the first. Are we the first intelligent species to exist on earth or was there something that triggered the global warming before us on Earth? And, you know, 200 million years is just 6% uh, of the age of, of the Earth. So it's just, again, towards the end of its lifespan, it's quite possible that we were not the first. Uh, I mean, humans were not the first. So even here on Earth, um, you know, we believe that we are the most uh, intelligent that uh, exists right now, the species that... Uh, is privileged to be in that state. And that's why we serve uh, in restaurants on the menu, less intelligent species for us to eat. And, uh, you know, if we ever encounter um, aliens that are as intelligent or more intelligent than we are, I would never dare to put them in my soup. We are actually receiving a dose of uh, modesty um, from uh, the possibility that our technological products, uh, artificial intelligence systems, very soon might uh, supersede our intelligence. Um, the uh, Imagine chat GPT-5 that might have more connections than the number of synapses in the human brain. It would be a more complex uh, entity than the human brain. And I would feel really bad uh, uh, taking uh, it out of uh, the electric power uh, outlet because it would be equivalent to uh, pulling the trigger on a person. And uh, that will be the first awakening that will tell us we are probably by 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 that time not the most intelligent uh, entity on, on earth because there are these AI systems that can do better than we, we can. And many people will deny it and argue that they are not there yet, but eventually it will happen, maybe a decade from now, maybe a little more, but uh, it's clear to me that we are heading in that direction. This is just the beginning of uh, 
our bigger awakening that in fact there may be a neighbor out there, a cosmic neighbor that is far more intelligent than we are. And for me, it's not so much, again, a battle, a conflict with our ego, uh, because I gave up a long time ago uh, on us being the most important thing in the universe. You know, I, I, I do believe that, uh, you know, since there are hundreds of billions of Earth uh, Sun uh, systems in the Milky Way galaxy alone, and then trillions of galaxies in the universe, I gave up on the possibility that we are the most intelligent that ever existed since the Big Bang, that Albert Einstein was the smartest scientist uh, for 13.8 billion years, that Elon Musk was the most successful entrepreneur. I, I think it's very likely there are uh, much more successful entrepreneurs out there. And if Elon, uh, you know, he put uh, his um, Tesla Roadster or as a dummy payload on the Falcon Heavy in the test launch of February 2018. Um, so now this uh, Tesla is uh, orbiting the sun uh, on an elliptic orbit. Eventually it, it may crash on Earth uh, within 100 million years. Uh, it's quite possible there are lots of uh, space trash objects out there that uh, collide with Earth. And um, of course, the astronomers would argue it's a rock of a type that we've never seen before, or the data is wrong because we cannot fit it with a stone. But uh, my point is we should have the humility, given that we are trashing space with objects that will not be functional in the long term and may exit the solar system. We should be humble enough to acknowledge the possibility that some of the objects entering the solar system from outside are technological in origin. And of course, finding you know, a tennis ball from a neighbor uh, would convince us uh, that the neighbor exists and may also teach us about uh, the habits of the neighbor. The neighbor might play tennis, you know. And, you know, if we were to find a tennis ball coming from interstellar space, I'm sure there would be uh, scientific papers arguing, yeah, it looks as if it, the, the neighbor plays tennis, but in fact, it may be uh, something else that it represents. And there would be conferences of scientists debating one way or another, uh, does the, the neighbor play tennis or not, and so forth. And uh, But but it's really, it will be a shock to humanity to realize there might be a neighbor that is more advanced than we are, and we can learn from it. And I'm already there. You know, for me, it's really important to search, because if you don't search, if you don't seek the evidence, you will never find it. And, you know, Elon Musk a month ago uh, gave a speech um, for um, uh, on Starship in 2024. And he said, I haven't seen any evidence for aliens. And on that, I say, well, you know, evidence or new knowledge does not fall into our lap. We invested $10 billion in the Large Hadron Collider to find the Higgs boson. We invested $10 billion in the Webb Telescope to find the first stars and galaxies, you know, you really need to put a lot of effort um, in order to find something new. You can't just say, I don't see the Higgs boson, therefore I, you know, it may not exist. This is not the right approach. It's just like a single person staying at home and saying, I don't see any partner around me, therefore I don't have any partner. Well, we all know that to find a partner, you need to go to dating sites. You need to put some work into this. You can't just expect things to happen to you. Uh, and so that's exactly the mentality that was adopted, starting with Enrico Fermi, you know, who said, where is everybody? And then, you know, that is a very presumptuous uh, statement for someone having lunch in Los Alamos. Why would they come to your uh, lunch table in Los Alamos in 1950? You know, the, un the universe has a, a, a history that is measured in billions of years. And the distances are, you know, thousands of light years. And the chance of them being exactly where you are when you are looking for them is really small. You have to put effort into that. And so that, I think, is really the mistake made by many people that are not seeking the evidence. And, you know, only over the past decade, we found the first interstellar objects. Uh, and two of them, two out of three, looked really weird. This uh, meteor that I described, and Oumuamua. And to me, it's a wake-up call. It basically says, let's check our neighborhood. You know, Muamua was the size of a football field. We couldn't see anything smaller than that from the reflection of sunlight. There might be many more. We never launched a spacecraft as big as uh, 
uh, as a football field. So, so I think you know we're just starting to be aware, become aware that unusual objects come from interstellar space. And for me, it's very exciting to figure them out. And as you said, I I, I look at it from the point of view of a kid. Uh, you know, not assuming that uh, we know the answer in advance, not trying to show off, just trying to find those things. Yeah, because that five-year-old version of you is having a blast with these ideas and is so proud of <laughs> you for the work that you've done and showing other actual five-year-olds here in their time that there's something to be revered in the sky that also may be connected to something fascinating and amazing. And you're not rubbing that aside. You know, you're not brushing that off, which is beautiful. This is why you stand out in your colleagues. And I don't know if you know this, but the origin of your name, Abraham. I mean, do you know Abraham's significance in the Bible? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean... Uh... Yeah, so I should say the name came from my grandfather who was born in Germany uh, for many generations, Albert, that was his name, and that's equivalent to Abraham. And of course, in, yeah, in the Old Testament, uh, obviously that name has uh, significance. Uh, yeah. What I find most fascinating about it is, is that uh, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, as you said earlier, even woven through your ancestry, you know? Uh, right. So to right. this would be uh, that God, you know, called him to leave his father of Terra, right? Which is Terra Firma, perhaps. Now, this is purely metaphor with this, which is fascinating. So he was called to leave the house of his father, Terra, and sell in the uh, in Cana, which is the promised land, right? For his progeny. Now, God's promise to that was, I will give you land for your descendants. I will make you a great nation. I will give you, I will bless you. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. So you, Abraham Loeb, left the Father Terra, the established community that said, no, you can't think like this. And you offered that five-year-old version of you, which offered all of us the opportunity to stake our num numbers in the stars here. Again, it's all very yeah. interesting. That's based well, on um, I should tell you, um, I, in two days, I will uh, be 62 years old. Um, and um, uh, I calculated that I started my career in in astrophysics about uh, 40 years ago okay and um, for 40 years uh, I, i've been doing mostly theoretical work um, basically uh, drinking from the fire hose of ideas uh, and that constantly, the desert. constantly come up in my mind uh, but um, over the past uh, six years or so since omuamua was discovered um, i decided to lead uh, experimental work uh, and uh, the hope is that uh, in this final act of my career, uh, I will get to the promised land, just the way the Israelites, uh, you know, it took them 40 years to go through the desert before they got into the promised land. So there is this coincidence that uh, there is a chance maybe that I will get to the promised land in the near future. And, you know, one thing, reason that I'm optimistic is when you take a path that other people did not take, uh, then uh, there is a chance that you will find some low-hanging fruit. And uh, that's what we are doing with the Galileo project that I'm leading. And, uh, and now we are planning to go on an expedition to the second uh, interstellar meteor. I should say the U.S. government was always supportive of what I'm doing. And uh, the U.S. Space Command provided us with data about this first meteor, despite the ridicule and the pushback from uh, astronomers, you know, and and you would, if you think about it, the U.S. government is a very, uh, you know, the the U.S. Space Command, very serious uh, organization. That's not part of the day job to help science move forward. But it's this irony that they are willing to provide data that is otherwise classified for us to advance our knowledge of interstellar space. And it's the scientific community, the, the conservative astronomers who worked on rocks and stones for years, who are resisting that knowledge and saying, no, we don't want your data. We think that you are wrong and and uh, there is nothing to be found instead of being curious about it and trying to figure out what it means. Well, there may be something and, too very and, powerful. And I should also say that this applies to the unidentified anomalous phenomena. Uh, as well, because the director of national intelligence, you know, again, an organization that receives a huge amount of funding is important for national security, comes out with three reports about objects they cannot figure out. What would the scientists do? The natural thing is to say, I'm curious to figure out what these objects are. But no, the scientific community is not attending to that. And that's why the Galileo project built an observatory that uh, is collecting data as we speak uh, at Harvard University 
we uh, looked at more than you know several hundred thousand objects and we are analyzing it with machine learning trying to see if there are any objects that are not birds drones balloons airplanes we are using machine learning software for that and then um, um you know so so this shows that you know we are curious enough to try and help the government and address a question that the public cares a lot about it uh, rather than you know work for 50 years on extra dimensions uh holography concepts that have no bearing on uh, our daily life and no uh, experimental verification the way that most of the theoretical physics uh, community uh, did uh, over the past decades and uh, you know to me it sounds like common sense that uh, one should attend to unusual anomalous uh, data uh, but common sense is not common and I should say that uh, there is the Munich security conference that uh, took place uh, just a few days uh, I mean a week ago uh, in Munich and the organizers this year uh, decided that for the first time to have uh, science featured. It's usually a very high level political event where heads of state uh, and, and uh, prominent um, uh, officials uh, participate, negotiate, discuss things, present things. So I was invited to that uh, first time uh, uh, science discussion and it was about space and I had a 45 minute a session that is uh, on video. Uh, you can find the, the link for that on my um, uh, medium.com uh, uh, web, website where I put the essays that they're uh, in one of them, I put the, the link to that. And, um, and, and so uh, it was really an unusual conference for me to attend a week ago because we went to have some drinks on the roof of that uh, uh, conference site. And, and then there were snipers there with uh, black covers on their head and i've never been to a conference in my career uh, with snipers on the roof obviously they were not there to protect me uh, they were protecting uh, kamala harris and uh, uh, and uh, vladimir uh, um, zelensky who were uh, on the same day speaking um, so um, uh, that was one interesting experience and then uh, a couple of days later uh, I was invited to um, give the keynote uh, lecture um, at, in Poland, uh, Torun, uh, the, the place where Nicolaus Copernicus was born. And um, uh, the Polish uh, government decided to celebrate 550 years to the birth of uh, Nicolaus Copernicus, who discovered that, you know, we are not at the physical center of the universe. The interesting story here is that the uh, he was a priest, Copernicus, and uh, he wanted to satisfy the interest of the church. And the church had a problem at that time. They could not forecast uh, the time of Easter. And uh, it was very important for them. And they were using the uh, theory of epicycles, the plot, uh, Ptolemaic uh, uh, model for the motion of planets, where the earth was at the center and they would get it wrong by a few days they just couldn't get easter predicted correctly so they were upset about it they said what the hell is going on we are using the best model and we don't get it right and then copernicus said okay well let me figure out a better model he was brilliant and he realized that if you put the sun in the middle instead of the earth in the middle everything falls into place. <laughs> and so he proposed this model. Now, um, the church didn't like it because the earth was not at the center, but they said, the model works. We will use the model, no worries. It will give us Easter. <laughs> so they were very happy, but they said, nevertheless, it's a theoretical model. And so it has nothing to say about reality. The earth is still at the center. It's just an effective theory that allows us to calculate Easter better. And because of that, Copernicus throughout his life hesitated, never published his book about it. And only, and, and he had a collaborator, a young collaborator, and only at the end of his life, when he had a stroke on his deathbed, he was presented with a published version of his book. And uh, the church banned the book. They made it a forbidden book until the 19th century. 
And it's really ironic because today you say, well, if someone proposes a theory and it agrees with data, that makes the theory believed, uh, believable. Uh, it's, it becomes part of the uh, of um, the truth that the science believes in. But back then they said, no, it's just a theory. It doesn't apply to reality. And uh, of course, now the church admits, I mean, thir uh, 30 years ago, they decided to accept the concept that the sun is in the middle of the of the you know of the solar system so anyway this was the copernican revolution and i was uh, asked to give a talk and i spoke about the next copernican revolution which is to find that we are not at the intellectual center of the universe that in fact there might be intelligence out there a neighbor that is better than us and of course many of my colleagues still argue that this is an extraordinary claim and it needs extraordinary evidence i think the other way around i think claiming that we are at the intellectual center of the universe is an extraordinary claim. It's very arrogant. And uh, for that, you need extraordinary... But, but these people are not seeking any evidence. And of course, if you're not looking for evidence, it's just like the church. You're not trying to check if your set of beliefs is correct or not. Um, and so um, these were two events, uh, the Munich Security Conference and the, um, this uh, keynote lecture in Poland, that they really were very uh, symbolic, I should say. At the end of the uh, event, uh, I was given uh, in Poland, uh, I was given the uh, book of Copernicus, which you can see on my side here, um, a copy of the book um, in, in a leather binding um, uh, from the governor of uh, Torun uh, in Poland. So. I really uh, felt uh, very honored to be there at that celebration. So we're running out of time here, and therefore I have only one question left. <laughs> <laughs> Since we were talking about our five-year-old selves, I know because I had four five-year-olds here myself at one point in time, and I'm glad these little bed bugs are grown up now, but um, five-year-olds sometimes get angry. So my question is, how often do you think about Oumuamua still and the possibilities that its exploration would have offered? Are you angry sometimes that you didn't have enough time to explore it? No, I think uh, in life you need to move on, okay? Because suppose you go to a bar and you sit there and suddenly you see an, an amazing person that you wanted to converse with and that by the time you approach that person, that person left already and uh, there is no way to find uh, that person. I mean, that's pretty much the experience with Oumuamua. Um, instead of agonizing and obsessing with a bad experience that you didn't man manage to learn more about that person, uh, a better approach is to look for uh, similar people, you know, like maybe someone else will come along, you know, just be optimistic. And uh, in 2025, there would be a new telescope that will survey the, the southern sky. It's called the, the Rubin Observatory in Chile. It will have a 3.2 billion pixel camera. And uh, together with my postdocs, we designed a pipeline, a, a, a software, computer software that would allow us to find objects like Oumuamua and uh, discover them early enough so that people can then look at them more carefully. And so that's my hope that uh, starting in 2025, we'll find maybe one or more, more every month or every few months. And uh, instead of obsessing with the one that we had in 2017, you know, my hope is to bring many more to our attention. And because it's unlikely that it was a one-time event, you know, it's probably the case that uh, more of the, these objects are around and we just need to keep looking. Awesome. Fascinating. So, yeah. I think we're at the end. I have so many more questions, but... Well, you, you can still ask uh, one more if you want. <laughs> I think... Hmm. I've got one. All yeah. right. So okay. uh, let's say a Moa Moa spins back around and lands on the Harvard Yard. You happen to be outside eating lunch on a beautiful day. <laughs> and they said, you know what? We went by uh, Robert Weirich's place. He said he's not interested the discover of a Moa Moa in 2017 for those listening. And uh, let's say that he passed on the opportunity, but it lands in front of you. It's this beautiful, amazing thing. Entities walk out and they say, you know what? Because of your work and being so cool about us, we'd like to take you on a trip of the universe. We'll tell you all of the secrets, but the trick is you can't come back. Would you go? Definitely. 
In fact, even if they offer me to come back, I would not. Wow. I'm really, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm optimistic. I'm very idea. disappointed by what is happening right now on Earth. You know, there's two wars going on. We're investing two trillion dollars a year in military budgets, and um, if we were to allocate that money to space exploration, we could launch a probe towards every star in the Milky Way galaxy within one century. It's just a question of priorities. But uh, I'm not naive like John Lennon. You know, I don't believe that uh, the way he said it, imagine all the people living in peace. You know, I just cannot imagine that. Uh, I do think that we deserve a shock therapy, that if there is a visit or um, a package that we find in our mailbox that in, in, implies that there are, we have a more intelligent neighbor next to us, that will give a shock to humanity. Uh, and of the type that uh, Copernicus delivered, you know, when he argued that the earth is not at the center. And that could change our priorities, I hope, for the better. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are worried about the threat, are worried that humans will go, you know, that uh, society will break down. I don't think so. The way I see it is more like the arrival of the Messiah, yeah, except the Messiah will not come from earth. It will come from another star. And uh, it will change our priorities because it's just like finding a smarter student in, in, in the class. You know, that y even though it, uh, it's a blow to your ego, you realize that you can do better and you can learn from that student. And that's the way I see it. And if I'm offered uh, to go up, I, I think uh, I will do it optimistically and not come back. Um, and, um, you know, because there, there is so much real estate out there uh, I'm really curious to see what's out there. Um, my, my wife says that if I go, she wants me to do two things. Uh, first, make sure that I leave the car keys with her, uh, not take them with me. And second, uh, to ask them not to um, ruin the, the loan in, uh, in, in the front of our house uh, when they lift <laughs> off. Uh, yes, but no trace but evidence, she, actually, right? she actually said that she will join me more recently rather than uh, stay behind and I see that as a sign of a good marriage. Fair enough. Yeah, so it's beautiful. Your, your answer inspired me. I have one more question too. Okay, go ahead. And I want to refer to you to the uh, to the article you sent me in the email when we uh, had our conversation for the podcast. Um, so how do you navigate the stark contrast between the open-minded, discovery-driven nature of scientific exploration? and the often pragmatic reality-based approach of politics. Yeah, I mean, first I should say that every person uh, that I meet has uh, in, in them uh, a childhood uh, curiosity. You know, It's unfortunate that very often on social media or in academia that, that um, uh, childlike bullying is more prevalent than childlike curiosity, but... I think that every person has it in them, okay? And, uh, and that includes people in government. So uh, for example, in December, I was visiting uh, uh, the US Congress and the person who hosted the visit comes out and I've never met that person. He says, I never believed that I would uh, meet you because I keep following what you're doing. And this is a very prominent person. Uh, and, um, you know, that gave me a glimpse at the, the childhood curiosity that that person has, that a, a high level political figure is really excited and inspired by what I'm doing as a scientist, driven by curiosity. So I think, you know, this is a subject that can unify across political parties, can unify people from different nations. I see it as a unifier. That uh, because all of us are curious to know if there is someone else out there, and the other thing is if if it's out there, you know, it's not nothing to do with a particular nation, with the way we split the land on this rock that we live on uh, near the sun. Uh, so I think it will bring people together. That's the way I see it. Or at least for now, I see politicians as a, uh, you know they are supportive and and helpful and trying to encourage me to do what I'm doing. Uh, and, um, you know, to me, it was surprising, but that's, that's the reality. So 
So that's the way I get the attention. And also, of course, I was interacting with Washington DC before I, st I started being interested in this subject, but I should say that it's all positive so far. Um, all the conversations I had with uh, high level politicians uh, were supportive. And which is interesting because the only negativity I get is from some jealous uh, individuals that are pretending to represent academia or uh, uh, just worked on stones for decades. Awesome. It's like you're the updated Reagan's UN address from 89 that talked about a universal threat coming from outside, but you're not phrasing it as a threat. It's almost like a no. rebranding of the opportunity that it brings to unite rather than us uniting over a threat. It's beautiful. Exactly, exactly. And it's not only Reagan, uh, it's also Stephen Hawking that a decade ago said that we should be worried about the threat. But uh, the point is that you know, if they arrive at our doorstep before we arrive at their doorstep, they're far more advanced than we are. So it's just like a biker passing on the street and looking at the ants uh, in the cracks on the pavement. You know, they don't pose a threat. I mean, if we are much less uh, developed technologically, you know, we are just a curiosity. And the journey started long before we came to exist because it takes, you know, many millions of years to traverse the distances between stars, you know, and so um, we just came to exist after they started the journey. They didn't have us in mind. Um, so it's an opportunity for us to learn about them. Uh, even if it's space trash, you know, we their trash is our treasure. Yeah. You know, when I was, uh, when I was very young, I was a bad boy. I it burned ants with my magnifying glasses, you know. <laughs> I'm a little bit afraid though so <laughs> <laughs> well okay so here is my hope that if they think of us as less intelligent they will not eat us they will not put us on the menus of the restaurants that's my hope yeah mine too Thanks. okay <laughs> yeah well thank you so much it was awesome I had a lot of fun today thank you so much for that thanks for having me it was a pleasure is there anything that you want to promote before we before we leave Oh, um, one thing is we are starting to plan the next expedition to uh, look for the second interstellar meteor. If, um, if there is anyone interested in helping to fund this expedition, it will cost uh, $5 million. Uh, they should get in touch with me. And second, um, the um, I post uh, essays on medium.com. If you just search for Avi Loeb at medium.com, uh, you can uh, find my essays every day or two or three, uh, and they are offered for free. You can have free subscri subscription there. Um, so these are the two things that I wanted to highlight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I subscribed, and your articles are awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Brandon, you want to wrap it up for us? This is outstanding. Uh, Professor, thank you so much for your time, honestly. This is a wonderful dive into the insights that you have with this and just to be able to explore a little further and knock some crows off the back because I can't handle that. I love that, man. What a wonderful <laughs> metaphor. I'll definitely be using that in the future. Thank you. Thanks for having me.